everybody. I'm Cheryl Klein. I'm the editorial director at Lee and Low Books. And this guy to my no, to my left is uh, Kyle Lukoff, the author of When Naden Became a Brother. Hi, everyone. And uh, we thought we'd start off by reading a little bit of the book to you, or Kyle's going to read a little bit of the book to you. And then we'll have a Q&A um, between the two of us and see how it goes. So I'm going to share my screen here. You got that, Kyle? I see it. So this is when Aiden became a brother. The way I introduce it to children is I say the words are by me, Kyle Lukoff, and the pictures are by someone named Kelani Juanita. And this is the cover. And that's the inside cover. When Aiden was born, everyone thought he was a girl. His parents gave him a pretty name, his room looked like a girl's room, and he wore clothes that other girls liked wearing. But as Aiden got bigger, he hated the sound of his name. He felt like his room belonged to someone else, and he always ripped or stained his clothes accidentally on purpose. Everyone thought he was just a different kind of girl. Some girls had rooms full of science experiments and bug collections. Lots of girls didn't wear dresses. But Aiden didn't feel like any kind of girl. He was really another kind of boy. It was hard to tell his parents what he knew about himself, but it was even harder not to. It took everyone some time to adjust and they learned a lot from other families with transgender kids like him. Aiden explored different ways of being a boy. He tried out lots of names until one stuck. They changed his bedroom into a place where he belonged. He also took much better care of his new clothes. Then, one day, Mom and Dad had something to tell him. I'm going to have a baby, Mom announced. A baby? Aiden said. Does that mean I get to be the big brother? Of course, said Dad, ruffling his hair. Aiden thought that being a big brother was an important job for a boy like him. He wanted to make sure this baby would feel understood right away. I love this so we're spread. On, we're leaving you on that cliffhanger. What's going to happen? <laughs> so. so what led you to write this book? Um, most, mostly spite. <laughs> uh, Always a good I, reason. Always a good motivation. Right? It works for me. Um, I had always, what do you say? Oh, I said it always works out so well in Shakespeare as well, but I'm sorry, yeah. carry on. Does it? Yeah. Does it usually? Um, so by the time I was working on Aiden, I had already sold one or two picture books. So I generally knew how the whole process worked. And at that point, I didn't know of any traditionally published picture books about trans boys. And I didn't really want to write one because I couldn't think of a way to approach that story that didn't feel either overly didactic or too simplistic or reductive or just like repeating common tropes that I didn't want to repeat. Um, but I knew that if I didn't do it, a cis person would get to it first and I did not want that to happen. Um, so the idea was kind of turning over in my brain when I had, I was homesick from work one day and I was making breakfast and I just had this brainstorm in the middle of grating a potato about framing the story around the child himself telling you about what his life used to look like and what his life looks like now um, and putting him in the center of the story that way and that that was what led to this book so mostly spite and then a brainstorm <laughs> but it didn't start as a book about becoming a brother necessarily or about no. the, 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 the initial frame was so about what's the child's identity if you want to see, if you want to have a good sense of the very first draft of Aiden, uh, I have this early reader called Call Me Max, mm -hmm. which is very similar to the very first draft of Aiden that I came up with. Um, and in that first draft, at the very end, the little kid, I think his name was like Henry at the time, uh, at the very end, the little boy is saying like, my parents made mistakes when I was born, but maybe we won't make the same mistakes for this new baby. Um, but I never like really introduced that journey. It was just like sort of an end scene. And I was in a meeting with someone who suggested that I focus it on just the baby. And that's what turned it from 
a different version of that book to what it is today. What did you like about the just about introducing the baby element to it? Um, at first, I didn't really. I was just like, all right, I mean, you're telling me to, so I'll do that. I take directions okay. very well, I think. Um, <laughs> and then I like worked on another draft of it that was a disaster. And then I was just felt like I was like banging my head against this wall, like, how do I tell the story? I don't know how. And then I did what I often do when I'm kind of stuck with how to explain something is I literally just imagine a group of my students in front of me and how would I talk to them? Because I'm good at talking to children. So what yeah. would I say to my children? You're a children's I, librarian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By I, your, I, your I used, so, yeah. I, my last right. week at the job was last week. Um, and I realized that if I had a bunch of first and second graders in front of me, I would say, well, when Aiden was born, everyone thought he was a girl. And I was like, that's, that's the story. That's how I started. And it just, I think it just all flowed from there. Um, it felt like I finally found the story and I didn't have to stop and think it just, it just happened. I wish I could it's remember that day better because it feels like magic now. Um, uh -huh. But I think I was just like in a state where it just, it just felt like it was coming out of me. It had all been inside you just waiting for the right channel maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, what, so once you had the baby frame plus um, Aiden's initial uh, recognition of who he was, um, what changed in the editing process beyond that? Do you remember um, very much or? What'd you say? I, I, I said, I, I said, do you remember very much? Because I was trying to think like, what changed yeah. in the editing process? And I feel like it was all pretty deep, but also very subtle. Yeah, I agree. Like, Actually on the I, page. Yeah. I think if someone, I think that if like a reader were to read the draft that I sent you and the final draft, it would be like, oh, this looks similar. This must have been really easy. Like it's probably right. the difference of 50 words maybe in a text that's under a thousand words. Um, but right. you and I spent a lot of time talking about like what was the essence of the story and what was Aiden's motivation and how was Aiden still growing throughout the story. Like I remember you had thought that Aiden was like pretty, pretty like well adjusted in his development. And now we needed to focus mm. on the baby. And for me, I was like, no, this whole story is Aiden continuing to develop and learn about himself. The baby is just a device for that to happen. I think I said like, I don't care about the baby. Like, it's <laughs> awful. Um, so yeah, I think that I will say was, that's a, I was gonna say that's a reflection of my own mindset and my own needing to be educated to, I mean, it's both my own mindset because I was having a baby throughout a lot of this process <laughs> and uh, the editorial work on this. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna reach over and turn off the baby's monitor because it's, it's it's, it's, it was on and he's threatening to wake up any minute now here. So <laughs> now that's taken care of. Um, but, uh, but I was having a baby throughout this process, but more deeply, like, I think I had mostly heard the transgender stories about the initial transition, you know, like most of the transgender stories I had seen and read about were very much about like, this is how I revealed to my parents that this has been my gender all along and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, um, and the, many of the stories seemed to end there. And so I think in my head, when I was first working on this, I, I felt like, okay, well now Aiden's story is done. And it really took our conversations for me to recognize no, transition is a lifelong process. Yes, yeah. I think what I said to you is that I am still not done. Like I am 36 mm. years old and I came out as trans when I was like around 20. Mm -hmm. And I'm still like constantly negotiating my relationship to like my body and my identity and my sexuality and like how I relate to being a man or not. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been doing this for a while, so... Yeah, and like, that's not something that we tend to talk about as much in, I mean, I think that's changing and that's not entirely accurate, honestly, but yeah. the larger stories, you transition and you're done and then everything goes from there as opposed to everything is just always still happening. For some, not for everyone, of course, everyone's different, but I wanted to show that Aiden was still growing and developing into himself and that that could only really start once he realized that he was a boy. That's not where it ended, right. it's where it began. Right, and then and then the book shifted because it's like the the whole title. Like I I, I think when you first sent it to me, it was called Aiden and the Baby. Yeah. And then I love the new title when Aiden became a brother because it's about him not just recognizing himself as a boy, but also growing into his identity as a brother, which yeah. um and and trans 
transitioning into that role within his family as well. Yeah. Um, how, how did you feel when you saw Kehlani's sketches and illustrations? She's so good. She's so good. <laughs> I think, I'm pretty sure I got the first full draft, like not the final draft, but the first full draft. I think I was sitting in a coffee shop in Northampton visiting a friend of mine. And I got to the page uh -huh. where they're in the hardware store. And I think I started crying in this coffee shop because it was just so much emotion in this like perfect tableau. And I just, I feel like every time I look at this book, I find new details that she put in. Um, and kids are pointing out new details and there's just so, so much brilliance. I just, it's, I love it. It's, she's amazing and I'm so happy with her. <laughs> I feel the exact same way. Like every time we looked at it editorially, you know, you're trying to go over it and like, is, are things consistent from spread to spread? You know, is, um, if his hair is one way on the next page and the next scene takes place five minutes later, his hair should still be the same way. And yet I still felt like I was finding new new things to love in it every single time. And that hardware, yeah. that hardware store scene was one that was really important to get right. I think we worked on that both textually and illustration wise because it's a moment where, um, here, let me bring up the, let me bring up that spread again, if you don't mind. Um, let's yeah. see here. Because that's a great one to talk about. Let's see, share screen. Yeah, I think we like changed the text after the illustrations, or like the two of them kind of were revised in tandem to one another. Yeah, which is something we often do, you know, late in the editorial process. So, yeah. So, do you want to read this real quick and then explain what's what? what was going on in here? Uh, yeah, so the baby's room needed to be painted, so Aiden and his dad went to the hardware store. Dad chose a gallon of sky blue paint and Aiden added a puffy cloud white. Are you excited for your new brother or sister, asked the paint guy. I'm excited to be, be a big brother, Aiden said. The paint guy looked confused. Aiden could tell that he wanted to ask a different question and was glad to have his dad there. Um, and I think something and then if you, you if you see the pink guide, like he looks not necessarily mean, but like confused and maybe not super charitable. Um, and Aiden looks sad and is clutching his baseball hat and dad has his shoulder, his hand on Aiden's shoulder and then Aiden's arm is wrapped around his dad's arm. And that little detail, like his hand on the arm. Oh, so cute. Um, and something that you and I talked about. It's such a mutual love and support. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so good. Because like you can yeah. tell that dad knows what's going on too. Right. Um, and when you and I, I think you and I talked about this scene and I think that there was some discussion of making it a little bit more clear. Like the pink guy was like, more are explicit. you explicit? More explicit. Like what, yeah. you know, the pink guy like actively misgendering Aiden on the page. And I wanted to avoid that one because I just didn't want to have that. But also I was remembering all these different moments when I was earlier in my transition where I didn't know what people saw when they looked at me and I didn't know what they were trying to find out by their questions. Like I remember one time mm. someone, I was working at a bookstore and this guy was going to ask me for help. And he said, excuse me, ma'am. But he also might've said man, but I thought Sorry. he said ma'am. And then I got mad at him, but then he looked confused. Cause like I had a shaved head and was like wearing a binder and like, you know, more traditionally masculine clothing. And, you know, I, to this day, I don't know if he said man or ma'am, and I also never forgot it. Um, right. And that sticks with me way more than when people like just straight up misgendered me because that like uncertainty is what follows me. Um, and I wanted to capture that, like, not exactly sure, but you're pretty sure and you don't like it, but yeah, just gets to you. Well, and one of the things I think you said to me about the scene was that Maybe my cis readers won't get it, but my trans readers will absolutely know what's going on. And that's what's important to me. And different readers will come away with their own interpretations. And that's yeah. also something that I wanted. Like I always, I like books that open up more questions than they answer. And that's what I was trying to do in a lot of different scenes. Yeah. Yeah, I just have to shout out like, <laughs> all, all the, one of the things I loved about working on this book was all the awesome clothes. Like from the very first time that, that Kehlani sent in her character sketches, I was like, 
this kid at age five or six is way more cool than I have ever been in my entire right? life. <laughs> like the jacket and the bow tie in like an earlier spread. Right. It's, so it's just, good. it's just delightful throughout and so yeah. colorful and there's so much to look at. And, um, yeah. and these parents are awesome too. Like, oh, yeah. I mean, dad's shirt here and, and yeah. And then here's painting this wonderful room. Yeah, we won't read the whole thing, but I'm just going to go through it just because. And, and another great thing that Kehlani did is she added so many wonderful details of her own. Like, like she invented the 50,000 names for babies and babies. Yep. When yep. I saw that, like, I knew that she was a perfect person to do this book. And then when I saw that detail, it just more perfect than I could have imagined. Because that's also right. the real essence of this book. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, if you look, readers, when you look at this back of this book, I, I always had a great time just following this cat around, like the cat yeah. all the way through is, is delightful. Also, I don't know if you can see, but I have this, that little scene tattooed on my arm now. I've got Aiden oh, that's right. yeah. eating with the cat on his back. Oh. And then all the patterns, like I, I, I kept saying to our art director, like, Kehlani should have a side career as a textile designer, clearly, oh, because... Shit. Yeah, she's got it's so many awesome things that. here. Yeah. And, um, and then the scene of love between the two of them where um, mom is affirming him and just so warm. We talked a lot about this scene too, where mm -hmm. I think, where um, Aiden decides to go back and looks at, and he looks at his baby pictures, um, but he ends up, uh, it helps him know how far he's come and that, and that was sort of the conclusion of his, not the conclusion of his transition, but a good waypoint on his transition within the book, I think. Yeah. That's where we ended up on it, yeah. And then this final amazing party scene, just so happy. Where, and the thing that I didn't realize until later is that all of the people gathered around are people that we meet earlier in the like little support group scenes. So like the parent taking the pictures there and then that person's partner is standing next to dad. Uh, we see almost all these characters earlier in the book. Yeah. Um, and they're all wearing, uh, one, child, one child said, do you know why everyone is wearing birds on their clothes on that last page? And I hadn't actually noticed that. And I was oh, like, wow. no, I don't know. And the kids said, or I think it was the mom reporting, but said, I think it's because they all feel free. <laughs> Which. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh, that's kids, amazing. It's, they've had the most amazing responses. It's really been wonderful. Yeah, so the book came out about a year ago and you got four star reviews. And, um, and but then the most important reaction really has been from readers. What have some other reader responses that you've gotten? Did. Um, one time I was doing an event at a public library in Champaign, Illinois, and a young, I think five or six year old, a young black trans boy came in to the reading with his own copy. And as I was reading, he was turning the pages with me. And uh -huh. at one point I like looked over and his mom had like, was like nothing like, that's your favorite page when I got to it. Um, and that was really, really magical. Um, yeah. when I did, I think the first, maybe the first public reading that I did was at a conference for young, for trans kids and their families. And I, when I got to the, they, the organizers just told the kids like, oh, we're gonna have an author read a book, but they didn't really say anything about me or about the book. And when I got to the page where it said, they learned a lot from other families with transgender kids like, like him, all these kids were like, oh, oh, I'm transgender too. I'm transgender too. Like desperate that I knew that about them. And I was like, I know friends, like that's why I'm here. But I was like, yeah, I'm transgender too. And that's why I wanted to share this book with you. And their little heads just exploded. Like they're like, wait, <laughs> you're the author and you're transgender. It's like, yeah, yeah, guy. And this one <laughs> little boy, like his eyes got huge. And he looked at me and he said, you're a trans boy too? It's like, yeah, buddy, I am. Like, where the you can grow. The you're a trans man. You grow up, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, like, you can grow up to be an adult who do, who does this kind of thing. And that moment was hugely powerful for me. Um, mm. And then just so many moments of talking to kids, like, and like their questions and their responses, and like sometimes trans kids would want to like talk to me before or after, which was always really special. Um, yeah. Oh, that's great. So, yeah, I'm uh, sad that school visits aren't going to be a thing for a while, but 
hopefully again right. someday. Fingers crossed on all fronts for sure. Yeah. Um, how did you feel when you heard you had won the Stonewall? Um, does it make me sound like a monster to say that I wasn't surprised? I was thrilled, obviously, yeah. but I, I've served on the Stonewall Committee. I was on the committee for two years in a row, um, mm -hmm. which means that I generally know how it functions. And also, you know, I'm also a children's librarian, so it's my job to read books for kids. And I had a pretty decent sense of what other books were out there. And I just knew that Aiden was really good. Like I, I knew that in, I, so I knew that in any reasonable world, Aiden would win the Stonewall. But I also knew that we don't live in a reasonable world and that anything right. can happen. So I was very relieved, um, very, very, very happy, but also like not surprised because I felt confident in what I had created. And you, uh, you, you clearly see a lot of books, both as a children's librarian and you review books as well. Do you, do you know how that influenced your, th do you remember how that influenced your thinking for the book other than when you were writing it, other than like knowing all the tropes and one way or another? And Yeah, I think just generally knowing what existed was really helpful in thinking about what I wanted to do and what I wanted to avoid. Um, right. It just gave me a better sense of what kinds of books were out there. And also since, you know, I, my entire job was reading to children it gave me a sense of what children respond to and when they get bored, when they're excited, what gets them distracted. Um, I've described to people that like my entire job is books. Like my, my right. whole thing is basically just books. Um, and I think it would be much harder if I didn't have that sort of years long grounding in both books for children in general and then specifically what kinds of LGBTQ themed books there are for like younger readers. I'm, I'm curious, going back to what you said, like that, that you, since you work so much with kids, that you knew things that kids like and would respond to. Is there a specific example you could point to that you put in the book? Um, uh, yeah, so Aiden is not really a funny book, even though I identify right. as being a funny person. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. People laugh when I'm around. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but there's not a lot of humor in that text, which kind yeah. of surprised me because I always imagine myself writing funny books. And the only funny line is the diaper scene where it said, mom, dad wanted to teach Aiden how to change diapers. Um, maybe later, said Aiden. He thought picking flies for his mom was more important. Sure. Um, and I realized that like, I think it's, I think that humor can be a default in books for kids. Like people are like, oh, kids like funny things. But I also knew that kids not only don't need funny things to engage with the book. It also gave me a sense for like how to maintain the flow of a story to keep their attention and engaged the whole way through. Um, mm. And it's a hard thing to put into words, but when I'm reading picture books to kids, sometimes ones that I'm not interested in are ones that just enchant them. Like it's a room full of, you know, even a class of kids, like six or seven year olds who are usually like wiggly and poking and yelling and fighting with each other. There's some books that just enchant, they're silent they're silent and they're fixated and it's like everything else just disappears. Mm. Um, and while I can't put into words what that quality is in a book, I've read enough of them to hopefully have a sense for how to replicate that. Right. Oh, wow. So what, uh, talking about writing and writing advice, like what advice would you give to children's writers who are dealing with the complexities of their own identities and their material? Like, um, for me, I'd say, and I can't tell anyone else what they should or shouldn't do, but right. I think what was really helpful for me was writing Aiden after I had already been out as a trans adult for many, many years. Um, and also being well situated in my career as a librarian. Uh, mm -hmm. Those two things kind of go hand in hand for me, kind of. Does, is that true? I don't know if that's true. I'll come back to that. Um, but I think it would have been much harder for me to write books about trans characters if I still felt like I was discovering both myself and also like, what does trans community look like? What has existed in trans history? Like what, what are the things that we've been arguing about for 40 years versus what are things that feel relatively new? Um, and I, I like that I have sort of a grounding in that. Um, so it doesn't really feel like I invented anything new 
with Aiden, for me, it feels like I've taken so much of what I've learned from my community and from being a trans person in New York City, but with connections like all over the country and yeah. to some extent all over the world. Um, so that I don't just feel limited by like, all right, I just learned this about myself. I have to tell everyone about it. It's, this is what like, this is what I, yeah. I'm just gonna keep- You have a whole myself. context, both within yourself and within the community. And like a really diverse and broad spectrum of other trans people outside of my own sense of self. Right. Yeah. And like, you know, I can see how that would give you a really firm base to write from and, and yeah. confidence yeah. in what you're doing and saying, yeah. yeah. Whereas there's other aspects of my identity that I don't feel as secure and that would be much harder to write from. Hmm. <laughs> That's the thing when I talk about writing with writers, I often start with like writer know thyself. And, and, and you know, and sometimes it's as simple as like, how do you organize information and how do you put that together? Cause that's a useful place to start from. Or what kind of books do you like? Cause that's yeah. also a good place to start from. But knowing all those things about yourself is always a place of better confidence than just writing into the void basically. So. Yeah. So what's next for you? What's next for me? Um my debut middle grade novel is coming out hopefully next april from dial books it's called too bright to see mm. and it's about a kid being haunted by the ghost of their dead gay uncle and it's kind of scary and sad but there's also like a lot of hope and joy in it um and then i'm working on a second novel for that same imprint but i'm that's still in draft form and then i have a new picture book but I'm not allowed to say what it is yet because we haven't announced it, but I'm very excited for that one. It's going to be my first, it's going to be my first nonfiction text. Oh, um, neat. And it's going to be a collaboration with someone who's kind of a hero of mine. So that's really exciting, but I can't say anything more about that. Um, and then I know what books I want to write next, but I'm very busy right now. So I haven't, started, <laughs> I haven't started those yet. They're just kind of percolating in the back of my mind. That sounds terrific. So. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any questions here necessarily. So, um, is there anything else you'd like to share with readers or people should know? Um, Today's election day, go vote in New York. <laughs> yeah. Um, find ways to join whatever Black Lives Matter protests are going on if you can, in whatever way feels like safe and sustainable for you. Um, and I don't know. Oh, I see a little red bubble in the Q and A thing. Oh, it says how. How does oh how does writing picture how, books how does, compare to middle grade? So, uh, so for me, and I've been thinking really hard about this difference. Also, that question was from Alex Gino. Hi, Alex. Um, for me, writing picture books feels like putting together a watch, where every single gear, every tiny little piece, has to fit together exactly precisely, or else the whole thing falls apart. Um, or at least that's how I like to write them, where every detail is extremely important. Um, middle grade feels more like you're juggling like a bowling ball and a rubber chicken, and the rolling ball is also covered in like grease and also a flaming torch, uh, and like three other things that you're just like juggling all these things all at once. Um, and when I was working on my middle grade, I tried to make every single detail match up to every other detail like I do with picture books, and that not sustainable like I was trying to have like literally every outfit and every meal and every thing perfectly line up within the text and then after I was like no like they just have to eat dinner they just have to have food on their plates and that's what they eat that day it doesn't need to have some deeper meaning um, welcome to life <laughs> yeah yeah so that's the main difference for me I don't know which is harder I, I, I sometimes think of like picture books are like sonnets, you know, which is very much like watchmaking. And, or sestinas, uh, any kind of yeah. formless poetry, really. And you you write sestinas too, right? I think I feel like I've seen. I've written a couple. Yeah. Yeah. They're fun. Yeah. And then um, and then novels are just novels, like and all the trying to ca capture all that. So. All right, and. Uh, there's a Somebody question, which is, Aiden has been on many queer LGBTQ plus book lists, but what about parenting, family, child development lists? What about them? 
I don't, uh, I mean, I think I've seen Aiden on some of those too. Um, I don't have easy links, but I definitely see it pop, on, pop, up, pop up on Instagram where people are like, are you looking for a book to talk to your child about this? Look at this one too. Um, I think it's making the rounds on a lot of different lists like that. Yeah. So it's just exactly at 1230, which is means our time together has pretty much come to an end. Um, for our viewers, we are going to have our next Tea Time Talk on June 30th at noon, a week from today. Um, and it will be a celebration of Julieta and the Diamond Enigma, the new middle grade novel from Louisiana Duarte Amandaris. And she'll be talking with her uh, editors, Stacey Whitman and Elise McMillan Ciotti about the book. So thank you, Kyle, for joining us for this Tea Time Talk. Thanks, Cheryl. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. So, Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.